Did everybody get a copy of the, the handout? I've got one. Okay. I'm actually more comfortable standing up. I appreciate your concern. I really do. Yeah. 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 Um, the um, uh, have a surgeon that uh, has given me a point for July the 29th um, by Dr. Geyser, and I'm going to try to hold out and see him. So she has given us a name of uh, another doctor that might be able to get in a little earlier. If it comes to that, we will do it. But uh, I'd like to just uh, hold off and uh, get in and see him if I can. And as long as I be careful, I, so far I've, I've done all right. And Sister Sarah had her um, endos endoscopy and colonoscopy uh, uh, yesterday. As a matter of fact. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, it was yesterday. Yes, yesterday. And that, that, so far that's fine. So we're good. So the older we get, the more visits to the doctor we get. <laughs> That's right, that's right, that's right, that's right, yeah, right. so we did that. All right, Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 10. Now, I've given you the, that, uh, that handout, that outline, and, uh, <clears throat> and it's got, hopefully everything we'll cover in it tonight, but uh, we're not going to go by that outline, because if we did, we'd probably be here until about 3 o'clock in the morning. So um, I'm afraid y'all wouldn't be with me that long. <clears throat> But we've come to a chapter in the Bible that's one of the most misinterpreted, misused, misapplied chapters in the Word of God. And I'm going to tell you why here right now in, in the very beginning. If you look down to Romans chapter 10, in verse number 9, Romans 10 in verse number 9, the Apostle Paul says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Okay, that's number 1. Number two is in verse number 13, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So <clears throat> there's a three-point requisite here to be saved. One is confessing, number two is believing, and number three is calling. Now, y'all need a, there's some few Bibles back there behind you if you want to get one of this. And so that's commonly, what that's commonly used is to show if you want to go to heaven, if you want to go to heaven, which is your choice, um, this was presented. You had to confess, you had to uh, believe, and had to call upon the name of the Lord to get to go to heaven. That's what it's normally used. The problem is that, um, that that is entirely out of the, out of context from what the Apostle Paul was teaching. So we've made it from Romans chapter 1 all the way up to Romans chapter 10. And over the last couple of weeks, we've covered some peripheral issues. As a matter of fact, last, last Wednesday, we did just a, um, a gross outline of Romans chapter 10. So tonight, Lord willing, we'd like to begin just a phrase-by-phrase -phrase, um, uh, discussion of what Paul is teaching in Romans chapter 10. So I'd like to begin with the first four verses. <clears throat> first four verses, if, and you have to get this right, or you don't get any of it right. Watch what Paul said, Romans chapter 10, um, uh, verse number 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And what, what is it we ask any time we see the word saved or delivered in the word of God? Always ask from what to what. And you don't answer it until the scripture explains it to you. Watch this then. Verse number two. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that will believe. <laughs> Just want to make sure you're awake. To everyone that believeth, that is, everyone that's in a state of belief, it's the end of the law. We'll come to that in a moment. Now, the first point I want to make is that Paul has a very deep and a heartfelt concern for his brethren among Israel. Um, he, he was praying for them. And we'll get to that aspect of it in a moment. Uh, but I do want to ask you in, in the very beginning here, do you suppose that Paul 
would be praying for something that has already occurred. If their eternal salvation has already occurred, do you suppose that Paul would be praying for that? I don't think so. All right, we'll come back to that. So he says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Then he says, For I bear them record. I'm given testimony. I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. Now, the word zeal, the word zeal has to do with energy and excitement and commitment. If you have a zeal to do something, you want to do it, you're full of energy, you're ready to go, you're ready to serve. That's what zeal is all about. If you're in a profession that you like, then you're going to have zeal for that profession to do the best job that you possibly can. To have the love of God burning in your heart is to have a zeal for the service of God. You don't have that zeal unless you have the Spirit of God in you. With the zeal of God in you, you have a desire to serve Him, to be pleasing unto Him. So they had a zeal of God. Now, the prepositional phrase, of God, points to the zeal. And so if they have a zeal, who gave them that zeal? God gave them that zeal. So Paul is laying the foundation that really explains the, the, the rest of this chapter here. And so if you're going to miss it, you're going to have to miss it on purpose. Now watch this. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of one. And Paul says, I bear them record. That is, I am giving testimony. I have observed that they have a zeal of God. For I bear them record they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Now, I gave you this illustration in the handout. In 1966, there was a football player, and his name was James Marshall. And he played for the Minnesota Vikings. And the Minnesota Vikings were, was playing against the San Francisco 49ers. Well, James Marshall caught the ball. And he did, some, <laughs> he did something extraordinary. He ran in the wrong direction. Full tilt for 66 yards. And he scored for the 49ers. <laughs> Now, huh? Oh, yeah, they did. Sure did. They counted it. He scored for the opposing team. Now, the point of that is he had a zeal. I mean, he was running full tilt, but he was going in the wrong direction. That's what Paul said about his brethren in Israel. They had a zeal, but it was wrong. They were headed in the wrong direction with their theology. So he says, I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Now, the word knowledge means what you know about something. You know, uh, Ronald Reagan said uh, in, in, um, when he was running for office, and just before he was elected to office, and uh, somebody, somebody, one of the reporters said to him um, something that the, uh, that the Democrats had said about him. And Ronald Reagan, in his cowboy fashion, he says, well, you know, he always started with well. He says, well, the Democrats say a lot of things. The only problem is they just say a lot of things that ain't so. <laughs> so, so that was his way of just, just selling the whole issue. And so that's what Paul is saying, that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. They're, the things they know, they just think they know it. They, they, they're professing that they know it. But what they know is just not so. There's a lot of people who know a lot of things about this chapter, but they just know a lot of things that is not so. And so we'll, we'll get into to, to that a little bit more in just a bit. Let me, let, me, let me tell you right now, there's a way that the Lord has blessed us so that we can overcome this problem. In Acts chapter 17, there was a group of folks from, this, from, from Berea, the Bereans. They were said to be more noble than those of Thessalonica because they did what? They searched the scriptures daily to see if these things be so. That means they spent time in the Word of God, reading and studying the Word of God, to find out if what they were hearing was the truth. And we all ought to do that. We ought to apply ourselves to the Word of God to see if what we're hearing is the truth. Well, now, Paul knew the truth. He, he was an apostle. He knew the truth. 
Jesus Christ, speaking in John chapter 4, turn back there with me just briefly, John chapter 4, Jesus Christ talking to a Samaritan there, said to the woman, in John chapter 4, in verse number 23, he says, For the hour, but the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in what? Truth. Listen to what else he said. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. So what that tells us is that with respect to worship, truth matters. By the way, there cannot, there can only be one truth. Um, you can't have two truths and both of them be true. Unless they're the same thing. Truth matters. You know, uh, truth has to do with the alignment of a standard. Okay? Law enforcement folks. You travel down the highway and they, they stop you for speeding at a 55 mile an hour speed limit. Uh, they stop you and you get a ticket. Some people get tickets for things like that. And so, <clears throat> believe me, I know. When you receive that ticket, it is against a standard, which is the law. The law says this is the maximum speed you can drive in this zone. If you exceed that, then you're subject to get a ticket and pay the fine. It's against a standard. God set the standard here. He set the doctrinal standard. He set, he, he set the truth. And everything we preach and teach and profess has got to be aligned with his standard for truth. We don't have the liberty to determine our own truth. We are commanded of God to worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, having said that, Paul knew the truth. So before we get into this, I just want to emphasize the point that the Apostle Paul knew what he was saying when he wrote Romans chapter 10 because God inspired him to say that. But also Paul himself knew the truth. And so Matthew chapter 1 verse number 21, um, when the angels were speaking to Joseph, Mary's uh, the spouse husband, the angel said to Joseph in Matthew 1 and 21, he says, Thou shalt call his name Jesus. Uh, and, and there's a reason you call his name Jesus. Y'all should call his name Jesus, for he shall do something. What shall he do? Save his people from their sins. Now, <clears throat> I believe in the sovereign, eternal, holy God. Whatever God is determined to do, he is going to do, right? Yeah. So if, if the angel, a messenger from God, tells Joseph, for he shall save his people from their sins, notice there's not an end there. There's, there, we are simply the recipient of what Jesus Christ did. He saved us from our sin, for he shall save his people from their sins. So we rejoice in knowing that he has accomplished what he was sent to do. All right? Now, Paul would know that. Also, turn with me to Romans chapter 3 now. Romans chapter 3. <clears throat> There's some other doctrinal points here that we need before we get down to the heart of this subject. Romans chapter 3, the Apostle Paul is writing this. So if he wrote this, if he, Paul wrote this, and he wrote chapter 10, um, he surely wouldn't uh, write uh, points of doctrine that conflicted with each other, wouldn't you think? So Romans chapter 3, and verse number um, 10. Let's go there first. No, beginning verse number 9. He says, What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before... Prove, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. That's point number one. They are all under sin, Jews and Gentiles, as it is written in Old Testament prophecy out of Psalm 14. As it is written, there is, now we need this, there's none what? How many? No, not one. Now Paul is making this emphatically clear. He goes on. Verse number 11, there is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are, what's that next word? All gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not what? One. And so Paul is making it clear that we are all sinners and that we're all by our nature unrighteous. That's startling in the view of many in modern Christianity. But it's the truth is declared 
by the Word of God in multiple places. Now, uh, look at verse number 23, Romans 3 and 23. Here again, Paul says, addressing the same subject, he says, For all have what? Sin. That's every one of us have sin. John said, in 1 John chapter 1, he said, He that saith he hath no sin deceives himself, and the truth is what? Not in us. And so we've all sinned, every one of us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we have not met the standard of glory that is required of us to enter into eternal heaven. We cannot possibly meet that standard because we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul also wrote Romans chapter 5, right? In Romans chapter 5, Paul said... For if by one man's, uh, this is chapter 5 and verse number 17, for if by one man's offense death reigned by one. Now what does that tell you? I know we've already covered this, but we need that to, this to get to where we're going to get to tonight, Lord willing. This is the word, let's read it again. For if by one man's uh, uh, offense death reigned by one. One man offended and one man brought death. Alright? What that tells us is that even if you could live in righteousness and never commit a sin, you're still a sinner. Amen. One man brought sin into this world and death is a result of that sin. So every human being at the instant of conception is in a state of sin. So when does the age of innocence begin? That predates Genesis chapter 3. Okay. That, before Genesis chapter 3, maybe. Okay. Now, Romans chapter 8, Paul understood these things. He wrote them. Romans chapter 8, Paul wrote this as well. Beginning in verse number 28, Paul lists five very specific things that work together for our good. What's this. And we know that all things, and he's going to define these things in a moment, work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the what? Called according to his purpose. Here are the five things. For whom he, that is God, did what? Foreknow. That word foreknow just doesn't mean that God just is cognizant. God is cognizant of everything and everybody. You cannot do anything that surprises God. The word foreknow has to do with God's loving knowledge of a particular people. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Do we believe in the doctrine of predestination? Okay. The word predestinate comes from the Greek word pro or idzo, and it refers to five different things in the Bible that God did predestinate. For whom he did foreknow, them he also did predestinate. And if God determined before that it was going to be with respect to these people, let me... Put it as plain as I know how. If God determined, it is so. It cannot be undone by anybody or anything. What about our unbelief? What if some did not believe? What does Paul say about What if some did not believe? For if some did not believe, shall their unbelief make what? The faith of God of not effect? And that faith of God is not your faith in Him either. That is God's fidelity to do what God the Father sent God the Son to do. Okay? All right? For whom He did foreknow, then He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of the Son, that it might be the firstborn among many brethren. His image is perfect. God determined, even before the foundation of the world, He set the destiny of His elect, we'll come to that in a moment, of His elect to be conformed to the perfect image of His Son. Perfect, meaning perfectly fit for heaven. Okay? Moreover, verse number 30, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. That's a big subject. But in particular, he's called, every, or will call, every one of his children. Sometime between conception and death, he will call them to spiritual life. Thereby we know him and love him. And whom he called, them he also justified. Now, to be rendered just is to be rendered righteous. The meaning just, you go to court, you get before the judge, and the case is laid out against you, 
and um, and both the prosecutor and defense attorneys present their their side of the issue, and the judge pounds the gavel and says, "Innocent. He has judged the person guiltless. They are not guilty of that crime." What has happened here in the doctrine of justification is that we are guilty. But Jesus Christ came to this world and gave his life for us and thus rendered us guiltless before God the Father. Being justified, that means the law has no bondage. So that's the reason Paul uh, continues on. He says, um, uh, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. If God has justified his children, can anything be laid to our charge? Anything that would hinder our eternal home in heaven? So can you fall out of heaven? No, you can't. Now watch this. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. To be glorified means to be exalted and lifted up into a holy state. Notice the tense of it. It is in the past tense uh, uh, state, and that is because Jesus Christ has fully and finally and eternally accomplished this for us. Then he goes on and says, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, if God has done all of these wonderful things for us, who can be against us? If he's washed our sins away, if he is, um, if he's foreknown us, if he predestinated us, he's called us, he's justified us, and glorified us, can anybody undo that? Absolutely not. Now, let's just keep going. Romans chapter 9, verse number 11. He says, for the children being not yet born. <laughs> Are you ready? Boy, I tell you what, this, this just really blows a hole through a lot of modern philosophies in Christianity. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to what? Election might stand. Not of what? Works. Not of works, but of him that calleth. That means your works did not contribute in any way to God's choice of you, nor in your eternal salvation. Jesus Christ, works were required, but Jesus Christ worked them all. He satisfied it completely. Now, Ephesians 1 and 4. Paul there says, same man that wrote Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, Paul said, According as he, that is God the Father, had chosen us in him, Christ Jesus, when? When did he do that? Before the foundation of the world, that we should be what? Holy and without blame. Holy. Holy. This is not, not holy like complete, but this is holy as in righteous. Holy and without blame. That phrase, without blame, means that nobody can blame you for sin with respect to your, your eternal state in heaven. All right? Now, Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 21. Go there with me. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 21. Of late, this is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 21. Now we're talking about those things that Paul knew when he wrote Romans chapter 10. He says, For he, that is God the Father, hath made him, Christ Jesus, to be what? Sin for us. Who knew no sin, he knew no sin, but he was made to be sin for us. That we might be, what's the next word? Made the righteousness of God in him? Made? That word is not offered, is it? It's made. And you know, if you make something, you gather all the necessary ingredients or parts, and you put it together, and you make it, and you walk away, your task is completed, right? God made you righteous. You didn't attain unto your righteousness. You didn't perform good works to, uh, to attain unto righteousness. You didn't inherit your righteousness. You were made 
to be righteous by God the Father. Now, Galatians chapter 5. Go back there with me just briefly. Galatians chapter 5. Well, this is, this is another one that's often used out of this context. Verse number 4, Galatians 5 and 4. Christ has become of not effect of you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. So if you're saying that there are things that I must do in order to become justified, if you say that and you live by that, he, notice, put it in his context, Christ has become of not effect unto you. If you believe that it is your works that justified you, then why did Jesus come into this world? Why did he die for you? If if you can justify yourself by your own works. Christ has become a non-effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. He didn't say you've fallen out of heaven. He didn't say you've fallen out of the love of God, because in Romans chapter 8, Paul there said that, that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. But you're fallen from grace. You've fallen from the benefit of it. You're, you're fallen from the joy of it. You're fallen from the glory of it. Um, you know, and you're constantly bound uh, with what else do I need to do? And maybe I messed up and I slipped back and, and I've fallen from, uh, from, from, uh, from God's love for me and, and, and God's going to throw me into eternal punishment um, uh, because I'm not quite meeting the mark. You know, <clears throat> many modern religions, they, they put up a requisite in order to obtain eternal heaven. And there's even some that will say that you, you must maintain that requisite and make sure that you're still maintaining it even at the point of your death because in your last hour, if you mess up, it's all for naught. You've lost it all. Paul is very clear. You've fallen for grace. That means you don't have the benefit of it. You don't have the joy of it. You don't have the peace of it. You've lost it. You haven't lost your salvation, but you've lost the benefit and the joy of that grace. Now, Second Timothy. Paul also wrote, wrote Second Timothy. The same Paul that wrote Romans chapter 10 wrote Second Timothy. This is one of the most powerful declarations of our, of our faith. It's in a, in a very concise way. It's presented in a way that um, you can quote it easy. It's presented in a way you can, you can find it easy in your Bible. Romans, I mean, uh, Second Timothy chapter 1, verse number 9. For the second time, let's go directly to verse number 9. This, he's talking about God from the previous verse, the power of God. Verse number 9, who hath saved us. You know, this is good grammar. The whole Bible is good grammar, right? The tense of hath saved is what? It's in the past tense. It's already accomplished. This is God who hath saved us. So if it's in the past tense, then what can you do to contribute to your salvation in the future? who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, then this is to make sure if Paul knew uh, through the Spirit, he knew that uh, there was going to be an argument against this doctrine. So he says, now listen, it's not according to our works. It means there's nothing that you can do to uh, obtain it, nor to secure it, nor to maintain it. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. That means what he's done for you, you didn't deserve, and you could not obtain it for yourself. Which was given us in Christ Jesus when? Before the foundation of the world. Well, if you could participate in it, you had to be before the foundation of the world, working it out. Okay, I'm old, but not as old as some of y'all. But I certainly wasn't there then. But it's now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death. This is Christ that's abolished it, not us. And hath brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. Another point here. We'll need this, not tonight, but later on in the latter part of Romans chapter 10. He brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The gospel didn't give anybody life nor eternal life. But it brought it to light, brought it to our understanding. That's what we're doing here tonight. We're examining the Word of God. We're prayerfully looking to God to give us understanding out of the Word of God. First Peter chapter 1, verse number 2. First Peter chapter 1, verse number 2. Peter 
Um, <laughs> Peter wasn't bashful. He just, I mean, he just let it rip. Um, he just, just let the entire cat out the bag right away. First uh, Peter chapter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and of the strangers, scattered throughout Pontius, Glacia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. In verse number 2, he tells us exactly who he's writing to. Who's he writing to? Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, and unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood. Whose obedience is it? Jesus Christ. And whose blood was sprinkled? Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Now, of this great body of people that our Lord has come into this world to save, to wash their sins away, John saw a vision of those people in Revelation chapter 7 and verse number 9. This is a fight of this scene. Revelation chapter 7 and verse number 9. John says, After this I beheld, and lo, the word lo, and lo, that signifies something magnificent. John said, I'm, I'm about to say something profound. And this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. He saw this great multitude so great that no man could number them. And they were around that throne in a state of glorious worship. What that tells us is you do not know how many will be there. Neither do you have the authority, the wisdom, the intellect, the spiritual insight to, to determine who is and who is not. We can see the evidence in, but you better be careful in judging who is not. The one that I like to use is, is Saul of Tarsus. When he left going to Damascus, when he, was, when he first entered the road to Damascus, if you had to make a decision then, is he or is he ain't a child of God? Which side would you fall on? By his behavior, you could see no evidence that he was a child of God. But when the Lord spoke to him directly, then that man said, Who art thou, Lord? He then knew him, and from that instant for the rest of his life, he was a changed man. Okay. Now, let's go back with me to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Apostle Paul is very careful to explain himself in great detail because even in his day, there were those who were arguing against the doctrine that he was preaching. Paul speaks of the peril of ignorance. The peril of ignorance. <clears throat> You brethren who were in law enforcement, if there was an awful flood and part of the road was washed out, you would back up down the road and you would put markers and barriers up to let folks know that down the road, the road was washed out. So you had to turn around. If those markers weren't there and people just went cruising down the road at 70 miles an hour when they came to that washed out period, there would be a great accident and people would be harmed, wouldn't they? There's a peril for ignorance, not knowing. And there's a sense here that these people should have known, but they were ignorant of it. That means they ignored it. And you know, they could read Daniel's writing as good as we could. They could read Isaiah as good, and they even quoted Isaiah, but they missed it completely. Now, <clears throat> Let's read verse number 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. Now, if you're righteous tonight, whose righteousness do you have? You have God's righteousness in you, abiding in you. Because you were made righteous by God. So they being ignorant of God's righteousness. That is, if they were ignorant of God's righteousness, 
they were ignorant of how they were made righteous. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, and because they were ignorant of that, they were going about to establish their own righteousness. That means they, they set up laws, they set up requisites and requirements to become righteous. Up here near where we live, Highway 279 comes from uh, Highway 77 over to Vernon. And ironically, it's a state penitentiary right there at that intersection. They, they, they've fallen down over the years. But there used to be uh, some signs uh, nailed to the uh, light poles out there. And the first one say, want to go to heaven. The next one says, say this. And the next one says, I believe. And the next one is, and Jesus Christ. The idea behind that, if you want to go to heaven, that's all you got to say. If you don't say that, you don't get to go to heaven. But that's a requisite. What if a person never learned to read? What if a person never drove by there and saw those signs? Well, they wanted to go to heaven, but they just couldn't go because they didn't say that. Paul says, for I... For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, they go about to establish their own righteousness. It means they set up a code. And now there were those, they were, they were Christian uh, Jews in that day. They believed, they believed what Paul preached, but they really believed that you had to be circumcised. They really believed that you had to be, or you really couldn't be a child of God. I mean, that, that was just a record. You couldn't be baptized for sure if you weren't circumcised. That was a requisite. That was a requirement. And some went on to say you had to keep various aspects of the law, certain things you had to do, or you, 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 you just weren't meeting the mark. Well, Paul is just laying all of that to rest. He says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, and they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now, when you don't submit yourself to the righteousness of God, you're failing to declare in a worshipful way, I am righteous because my God made me righteous. Now, how did he make you righteous? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came into this world, gave his life, paid your sin debt, washed your sins away, and thus made you righteous. So if you say, if you say, well, I, I, I need to participate in this to help God make me righteous, then you're saying that I need to help Jesus be Christ crucified. I, I need to participate in this because Jesus Christ didn't quite finish the job. Well, the problem with that is Jesus don't need your help. That's one. Because he's God. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are what? One. That means he's God. And so God don't need your help to do anything. Now, he commands us to do certain things. And there's a penalty in this life if we fail to. We'll get to that in just a moment. Now, in Isaiah chapter 1, hold your hand right there and go back with me to Isaiah because we need this. And we'll get back here in just a second. Isaiah chapter 1. Paul quoted Isaiah chapter 1 and verse number 9. And he's talking about a rebellious nation, a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity. And he comes down to verse number 9. He said, except the Lord of hosts had left us a very small remnant... We should have been as Sodom and should have been made like unto Gomorrah. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? They were utterly destroyed. So what he's saying, if God had not left us a few, we'd have all been destroyed. We, we, technically, we should have all been destroyed because all of our righteousnesses, Isaiah 64 and 6, all of our, all of our righteousnesses are as what? Filthy rags. We're all undeserving. And so, technically, we should have been, but out of his grace, he's reserved, in this case, he said, a very small remnant that were not destroyed. Now, he's talking about in time. You know, the children of Israel, they found out that what that meant. Go read the, the last chapter of Second Kings and the last chapter of Second Chronicles, and you'll find out exactly what this meant. Because they were destroyed. Their whole city was ruined and destroyed. Now, Paul is telling them, this is about to happen to you. Now, turn back with me to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Beginning reading of verse number 27. Isaiah, or Isaiah, 
also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel shall uh, be as the uh, sign of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. There's a great a number of them, a number so great that no man can number them. He says, but a remnant shall be saved. Now for what, Israel? From the invading armies that would come in and destroy your land, destroy your city, destroy Judah. A, a remnant, a very small remnant is going to be saved. Verse number 28. He says, for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness. That means when, when, the, when the Chaldean army came in and destroyed the Old Testament city of Jerusalem, it didn't take them long. Now, Paul is prophesying, prophesying that it's going to happen again. It is going to happen again. In 70 AD, it did indeed happen again. And it didn't take the Romans long to do it either. He says, for he shall finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon them. It's true that the Lord used the Chaldeans and he used the Romans. It's true that he used them, but I, uh, it doesn't make any difference who it is. When the Lord commands them to go, they go. They follow his will to carry out his will. And now watch this. Because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth, and as he says, or Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth, which means... The same thing is a transliteration from the Hebrew to the Greek to the English, which means the Lord of hosts, means the Lord of a great army. Um, that is a picturesque way of putting he's the almighty, the sovereign God. It's like a, a great military, the, the images of a great military commander. He is the commander of a huge army with all kinds of equipment, and he has all kinds of power with him, and you just can't stop that commander from, uh, from defeating you in battle. He is that powerful. So that's the image of God. He is the, as a matter of fact, one of his names is Commander. Isaiah tells us that's one of his names. His name is Commander because he's the commander of great power. He commands and it stands fast. He's the eternal holy God. So he's telling us, except the Lord of Sabbath, that is the Lord of hosts, this great commander, had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom had been made like unto Gomorrah. Just like Isaiah said, if God had not been merciful to preserve a few, the whole lot would have been destroyed. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to the righteous. He says, Paul is leading up to, his, to chapter 10. He says, let me tell you about the Gentiles. They followed after righteousness. They followed, that is, God's righteousness. But they haven't attained unto righteousness. That means they didn't earn it. But they followed after righteousness. That's what I trust that we're doing tonight. We're following after righteousness. We're proclaiming the righteousness of God and how we became righteous. Even the righteousness which is of faith. That means the fidelity of God. Now, back to... Um, let me touch this first. Matthew 24, verse number 2. The Lord repeats this. It's repeated three times in the New Testament, in Mark and in Luke. He tells the brethren, when they take him to show him the, show him the temple, and the, the fabulous temple of how magnificent it is, and, and the Lord tells them, there will not be one here, one stone left upon another. That means it's all going to be destroyed. Every bit of it. And he's talking about the, uh, the, uh, the, in prophecy of the coming of the Roman army that's going to utterly destroy the city. Nothing will be left when they destroy it. It's going to be utterly, completely uh, destroyed. Now, why is it important? Why would the Lord tell them that? Because they were going about to establish their own righteousness and have ignored the righteousness of God. He came unto his own. But his own, what? Received him not. So, Paul says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness, there's a peril of ignorance. Now, I mean, if you, uh, there, 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 there's a peril in not following the truth of God. Remember, he seeketh such to worship him, who worship him in spirit and in what? Truth. He says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves. You know, one of the requirements for us for peace and joy in this life is to submit ourselves unto God and to his truth. Okay? Have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now, before we get to the next verse, I must cover this. Turn to page. Romans chapter 11. 
Verse number 21. Here Paul says, and he's writing to the brethren in Rome, the Christian church. I trust that we are a Christian church. He says, for if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. I hear the goodness. I like to preach the goodness of God, don't you? I, I, I love, I love it. I like to preach about the good things of God, the good things he does for us, how he lifts us up and blesses us. But we must never forget, while there's goodness, there's also severity. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, when the city fell, when he chastened them, which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his, other, his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. Does it apply to us? Why, well, certainly it does. You know, Paul even had to keep under himself, to keep himself under subjection, uh, because he, he, you know, he allowed that it was possible for him to slip too. And so we all, we need to stay in the Word of God. When Paul told Timothy to study, to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, he's telling the, the, the preacher, he says, you stay in the Word of God. You study, you labor, you learn, you keep learning, you never quit learning. You learn and learn the Word of God. It's good to find out what other people say, but you learn what the Word of God says. As a matter of fact, he told him, in preacher, he says, you preach the what? The Word, the Word, not a Word, not your Word, but the Word. That is the Word of God. Now, Romans chapter 4, uh, chapter 10, verse number 4. <clears throat> you fellows are not old enough to remember this, but I'm going to tell you something that may be a couple of folks to remember. The old movies, long time ago, when it came to the end of the movie, the whole screen was filled with the words, the end, as if we weren't smart enough to figure out that that was the end of the movie. So they told us in great big words, the end. That means that the movie was over. So if you were in a movie theater, that's when you took the rest of your popcorn and you, you left because the movie was over. There was nothing else. If the end was there, you, you, there was no reason to hang around uh, because it was over. Notice Paul's language here. For Christ is the end of the law. I mean, the law is over. And it's over because he satisfied every requisite of the law. Everything that was required under the law, Jesus Christ fulfilled it. Now, to emphasize that, when Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross, getting close to mid-afternoon, about three o'clock in the afternoon, God the Father had already turned out the lights on the world around noon, and it had become very dark, and in the midst of that, Jesus Christ was made to be sin for us. And he bore our sins away, and he cried to his father, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then Jesus Christ made this declaration. It is finished. John 19 and 30. It is finished. That's the end. That means I have finished what you sent me to do. I have satisfied the law. I have washed their sins away. I have justified them. I have glorified them. Their home in heaven is secure. Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 5, Jesus Christ is the faithful witness, even now on the right hand of the throne of God, bearing witness that he has paid our sin debt. Our home in heaven is secure. And so the question is, is there anything that could separate us from the love of God? Paul tells us in the latter part of Romans chapter 8, no, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. We can't be condemned. We can't be convicted because Jesus Christ has justified us before God the Father. Now, so he says, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. That means you're righteous and that's it. In prophecy, three times, Jeremiah refers to Jesus Christ of the Lord is the Lord our righteousness. You're righteous because your Lord is righteous and he's imputed his righteousness unto you. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. That doesn't mean that belief 
is a requ requisite so you can, you can obtain this. What that means, to have the joy of it, to have the peace of it, to have the happiness of it, have the contentment of it, you need to believe it. You know, believe it. You know, it's like all that medicine and stuff we take. If I didn't believe it would do any good and didn't take it, I would get no benefit from it. Well, some of it I wonder about, but I take it anyway. But, but you know, if you just say, I don't believe that's going to help you, you don't take it, you're going to get any benefit from it? No. Well, the point is, to believe this is to rejoice. Job believed it, didn't he? Job 19, I know that my Redeemer lived. I know it. I just know it. And one of these days, I'm going to see him with mine own eyes. I know that is the truth. And I rejoice in it. You know, Paul believed it too. Paul said, to die is gain. To want to be with the Lord, he says, that's far better. Paul could give personal testimony that it was better to die and go on to be. He saw, also said to live as Christ. He said, but while I live here, I get to serve my Lord. We ought, we ought to have that dual view ourselves. You know, to go on to be the Lord, that, that's certainly better than anything here. But the great joy we have here is in serving our Lord. So for Christ, for Christ is the end of the law for righteous to everyone that believeth. And Jesus Christ declared, it is finished. And he was speaking to his father. I have paid their sin debt. Their home in heaven is secure. Jesus Christ, just hours before that, and the night before, John 14 and 1, he comforted his brethren. And he was told them, he told them he was going away. But he said to them, John 14, 1, he says, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go. In my going, I go to prepare a place for you. It's true. He's accomplished it. So now we said all of that because Paul would not have professed those things, understood those things, and believed those things if he believed that Romans chapter 10 and verse number 9 meant that if you want to go to heaven, you have to confess and believe and call upon the Lord. He would not have done that. Because this, that position on these uh, passages is not consistent with what he wrote other places. Now, so just in summary, what he's teaching us, that if you want to be saved from the peril of ignorance, from what happened to Israel, the Lord of Sabbath, you want to be saved from that. Father, I, I bear them record that he have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. He says, you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And by the way, if you can confess the Lord Jesus, if you confess that, not just call his name. Call his, you, you can call his name all day long. If you don't know what it means, he still ain't done anything. If you confess the Lord Jesus, you're saying, he's my Lord, he owns me. He has authority over me. If you confess Jesus, you're declaring that Jesus, confessing that Jesus, Jehovah, is my salvation. That's what his name means. So he says, For if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That is from the peril of ignorance, not to eternal heaven, because Jesus Christ has already accomplished that. Is that good news? That's good news for you because I slip. If I don't say something I'm not supposed to, I surely think things I'm not supposed to. I was telling Sarah today, there's things that come to my mind that I pray to God, I never, it never comes out of my mouth. It just, just, it comes to my mind and I hope it just stays right there. I told her, I said, you know, if I lose my mind and I start saying things, just go, just go ahead and take care of business right there. Uh, cause I, I, I just, I just, just don't, I, I don't want to be an offense to me or anybody else. But if I do, that is not going to hinder my home in heaven because Jesus Christ is the end of it. He's finished it. Okay. Anybody got questions or comments? Okay. Lord willing, the Lord be pleased. We'll pick it up next week in verse number 5. Talk about what Moses described as the righteousness of the law. I'll see what the